Good morning, Second Mount Zion. Good morning, Second Mount Zion. Thank God for another wonderful day. For I don't know what the week has bought you, and you don't know what the week has bought me, but thank God that he's brought us all into his house this morning to praise his holy name. As we stand, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory.
Good morning. I couldn't hide this morning, so Chris made me come. <laughs> I'll be reading the scripture, Psalm 27, verses 3 um, and 4, and then skip down to 13 and 14. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And we're going to skip down to 13 and 14. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Good morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, O oh God, to give you praise and to give you glory and to give you honor that is due unto your name, dear God. Father God, we thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for strength, dear God. We thank you for everyone who is able to make it out to church this morning. We thank you for those that are viewing near and far online, dear Father. And even right now, Father, we thank you, O oh God, Father, for your Holy Spirit, O oh God, being with us, dear God. Father God, we just ask, O oh God, that in service today, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit, O oh God, will intervene in our lives, dear Father. Father, would break yokes, dear God, would mend hearts, dear God, would regulate minds, dear Father, that your Holy Spirit would move, dear Father, as you see fit, dear Father. And even as the preacher comes late on uh, this morning, oh God, to uh, preach your word, dear Father, we just ask, oh God, that your word, oh God, Father, will just really be on our hearts and we'll be able to apply it to our daily lives. All these things we ask in your Son, Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning. Just a few announcements before we turn it over to the choir. That way, once the church school teacher gets up, they can just get up. As always, um, we ask that you send all mail correspondence to our P.O. Box, uh, which is P.O. Box 41839, Philadelphia, PA 19101. Um, those that are in person, you can use a tie box, um, or actually we, we march nowadays, so you only have to use the tie box, just hold it until um, ties and offering. Also, you can use the Easy Tie app, or you can scan the QR code that will be on the screen during ties and offering. Um, if Simpson was here, he would say, please refrain from the eating and drinking in the sanctuary. If you have to eat or drink, we ask that you just use one of the lobby areas, either to my right, Annex West or East, West or East? One of them. <laughs> Just follow the exit signs, how about that? <laughs> um, Sunday, August 13th, the educational ministry, um, they, they'll be giving out scholarship money and book bags for all kids that are present. Now, the key word is present. We're asking members to bring out their grandkids, their nieces, their nephews, their children. We're asking that they bring them all out on August 13th. Children must be present to receive a book bag. And also, uh, there's going to be a special treat, so you don't want to miss that treat. I don't know what it is, but I know I'm going to be here, so I don't miss that treat. Amen? <laughs> um, Bible study. There will be no Bible study for the month of August. That's for the entire month of August. That's both noonday and 7 p.m. We will be back here in person. Now, I hear that the noonday is doing very well on, on, on attendance in person. But both noonday and 7 p.m. will be back here September 13th. That is the week after Labor Day. All right? No Bible study for the entire month of August. Now, if you get here and we see you on the cameras, maybe I'll just tell Pastor that somebody's outside waiting for you. <laughs> and last but not least, the church picnic. So we've been prepping for this thing since earlier this year, and it's finally happening in six days, um, August the 5th. 
Um, we have those that registered. We have a lot of folk that paid. We do have some folk that still pending payments so they can, you know, see me or either one of the trustees. Can y'all turn seven down just a little bit? Thank you. See, see myself or one of the trustees, use your envelopes, please. Um, you can just kind of just add a other column, say, you know, Liberty Lakes or Church Picnic or anything like that so that the, the trustees will have knowledge on that. For those that are driving, so here's some instructions. For those that are driving, uh, do me a favor, can you put the address up, please? Those that are driving, the address is 1195 Florence Columbus Road in Bordentown, New Jersey. 08505. Leave that up for a second, AJ, as I continue the announcements. Um, and we ask that everyone arrive by, by noon, 12 p.m. Amen? 12 p.m. <laughs> Can't stress that enough. 12 p.m. Um, the bus will leave Second Mile Zion at 11 a.m. So for those that are riding the bus that signed up for the bus, the bus will be leaving here at 11 a.m. We ask that you arrive to the church by 1030. Similar to catching a flight, you know, they start boarding, you know, before the flight takes off. So I, I'm giving specific instructions to the bus driver to pull off at 11. Amen? Now, if you're delayed, please reach out. Don't just assume that we're just going to wait for you. Amen? So try to be here by 1030 a.m. The bus will be leaving 11 a.m. sharp. Somebody's already on their way to uh, Liberty Lakes. <laughs> Amenities. So just a reminder, they have pools. They have pools there. I'll try to stop saying the P words that much. <laughs> they have pools there. So we ask that you bring your swimwear, life jacket for kids. They will have lifeguards on duty. But we ask that you just bring these items as well as sunscreen. Anything you need that kind of that you plan on getting wet, just bring it, please. Amen? Amen. On top of that, they have fishing. You got to bring your own gear to fish. Um, I'm quite sure Pastor may have a couple of extra rods in the event that somebody want to cast. They'll have paddle boats, other lake activities, playgrounds. And I can't stay away from these P words because they're all in, in, in my notes. <laughs> But they have a ton of things to do. If you've been to Brandywine, it's like Brandywine times two. They have a ton more things to do. Um, so we ask that you just come ready to play. Some additional announcements um, or instructions for that day. Once you arrive to the, to the park, um, your shirt is going to be the indication that you're with Second Mile Zion. So as soon as you go up to the front desk, they're going to ask you who you're here with. Just tell them you're here with Second Mile Zion. They're going to direct you to our pavilion. Um, at our pavilion, there's going to be a, a checklist with your names on it. We just ask that you check off your name. That way we can keep our count. The park is actually going to keep a count via head count. So we told them that there's 101 people coming. We're not expecting to see 108, 110, 115. Because if we are, then Second Mile Zion will be on the hook for making that payment. I think we gave you guys enough time from when we mentioned this back in February till even as of yesterday, I still was taking, um, people were still signing up yesterday. But the sign up sheet is done. If you choose to come, you can come, but you'll just have to pay at the gate and there won't be a shirt available for you, okay? And last but not least, um, I kind of mentioned it, oh, sorry, two, two more things, T-shirts. We'll be passing out t-shirts. Couture and myself will be passing out t-shirts in the back of the church immediately following service. So we ask that if you pay for your t-shirts, just come see us in the back and pick that up so that you can you know, go ahead and press it and be all you know, decked out on Saturday. Or if you do not pick it up today, we'll make sure to bring it Saturday and have it at that check-in table that we'll set up. Now, be mindful that we're trying to enjoy ourselves as well. So I'm not trying to be at that check-in table for more than 15 minutes past the time we open up. Amen? And last announcements, outstanding payments. Those that have an outstanding payments, we ask that you just use the envelope, use the Easy Tie app, and just make sure you kind of note that for um, the church picnic. Are there any questions since I'm up here? Amen. In the hands of our choir. Huh? <laughs>
King Jesus. Puts us right into the Sunday school lesson. Where, where are we at today? Matthew? I think, they, I think the, the book entitles it Finding, Finding Hidden Treasure. So how do, how do we get here? How do we get to Matthew 13, 44 to 52? Uh, we get here because we find ourselves following the Jewish community from which Christ came from. The Jewish community from which Christ came from, um, if, if we know anything about uh, the Jewish faith, we know that Adam was the first man. Adam being the first man fell victim to sin. And being that Adam fell victim to sin, there was a need for a new Adam. That new Adam came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. The problem with the new Adam coming to earth in the form of Jesus Christ is that you are now changing hundreds and hundreds of years of what the Jewish faith had begun to evolve into. The Jewish faith had begun to stray and lose sight of the faith that it held fast to in its origins. They begin to build on and build on and build on and build on the faith with a lot of man-made rules and principles. And what we understand that is not only is Jesus Jewish, but he chose Jewish men to be his followers. The disciples were regular, ordinary men out of Jewish customs and traditions. And coming out of these Jewish customs and traditions, we go to chapter 12 and we find out that they were accosted by the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees would have been the leaders of the church in that day. The deacons, the preachers, the elders, they would have been those people. And remember that the world wasn't as vast as it is today, so those communities were much more intimate. So if they were accosted by these scribes and Pharisees, chance is that they knew these scribes and Pharisees. They had sat under the teachings of these scribes and Pharisees, and now they're rolling with Jesus, and they're off base with what the scribes and Pharisees had been teaching. Scribes and Pharisees ask, they say, uh, your, your disciples, they're, they're eating wheat on the Sabbath day. Is that lawful? And Jesus had to reply and help them understand that he was the Sabbath. And then you go a little bit further down, and there was a man with a withered hand in the, in the synagogue, and they asked Jesus, they said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus had to correct that rhetoric as well. So as we get to the end of the chapter, Jesus goes in the house, and as we start chapter 13, Jesus found it necessary to come back outside of the house. And as he came back outside of the house, there was a multitude just hovering around waiting to hear more Jesus. And Jesus gets in the ship and launches off so that he can make himself a makeshift pit pulpit to teach the multitude. And as he's teaching the multitude, the disciples come unto Jesus. And they say, Jesus, why are you talking to them in this manner? Why are you teaching them in this manner? And Jesus unfolded to them that it is not for the multitudes to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but for you whom I have chosen to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And so we fast forward a little further in chapter 13. They ask Jesus, they say, what do these sayings mean about wheat and tares and fields and such? And now we find ourselves in chapter 13, verse 44, where Jesus starts off with the word again. The word again signifying that he is once again beating home a singular point for his disciples to get hold of and understand where he's coming from. He starts off and he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field the which when a man hath found and hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that fill. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one good pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the situation in today's Sunday school lesson is that Jesus is seeking to instruct his disciples, his followers on his word. The complication will be having ears and unable to hear. The gospel solution is going to be having God's word audible in your life. And our aim for this morning is, yes, Jesus is talking to you. So as we look at these first two verses, where Jesus says again, and he makes the comparison of the kingdom of heaven to a treasure hidden in a field and a pearl of great price. The lesson connotates to us that since these people who find the treasure and find the pearl are going to go buy these items, that the items already belong to someone. And if the items belong to someone, and these buyers see such great price and such great worth in them, then that means that the owners that have these things right now do not see the same value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is the same thing with the Jewish culture. Jesus was right there in front of them, fulfilling every messianic prophecy of the Torah, of the Bible, and they did not treasure the treasure that was directly in front of them. This, this, this field, it had a treasure that was worth so much that the purchaser went out and he sold everything that he had in order to buy the field. This pearl was of such great value that when the purchaser went, he took everything that he had to bring back and buy that pearl. And that signifies to us that our walk with Jesus needs to be worthy of us giving up everything. Because there's a lot of times that we don't want to give up the things that are close to us in order to closen, closer walk with God. We give up a lot of things that are close to us for the wrong reasons. Some of us give up friends and family to be with that person that we want to be with. Some of us negate church to go to a job that pays us less than what we're worth. Some of us go back home to people who devalue and don't value the things that we bring to them and will give up our walk with Christ for the sake of these items. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this lesson is teaching us that no matter how much value you put on these things, if you take these things and turn them over to Jesus and focus singularly on your walk with Jesus Christ, not only do you have, not have to worry about losing those things, but God will replenish them much greater than what you had in the beginning. Jesus is telling these folks, his people, his followers, at this point he had thrust the multitude away and he's only talking to his disciples. And he's telling them a prequel to what they can expect. The disciples, when they followed Jesus, they didn't follow him for money because there was none. They didn't follow him for fame because there was none. And Jesus was telling them, although it looks lonely and hard right now, give it all up for my sake, and I guarantee you I will give you a treasure that is worth giving it up for. We knew that Jesus was going to be marched up to a hill to be put to death. And at this time, the disciples were not fully aware of exactly what was going to happen. But what Jesus wanted to ensure was that their walk with him was going to continue because he was entrusting the gospel in their hands when he was departed. As we learn in Acts, all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach was handed off into the disciples so that they can enhance the kingdom of God. And this morning, I'm looking at each one of you this morning and saying, yes, God is talking to you because we are his vehicle in this day and age to show the world a living savior. 
And are you willing to give up some things that seem valuable, that feel good, that look nice to you now in order for the sake of the kingdom to be advanced and God's will to take form in your life? They bought these things again. And again, he said, 46 says, who when he found one great pearl of price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. 47 tells us, and again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered every kind. This parable goes right back to the, the parable of the tares and the wheat. Jesus told them about the tares and the wheat. You put the seed of the wheat in the ground, and the enemy came with some bad seeds. And the husbandmen of the field said, should we pull them up? And Jesus instructed them and said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. That kind of takes to us that there are some good people growing amongst some bad people. And some bad people growing amongst some good people. But you put them all in God's hands and he will be the separator of all. Far too often we try to separate for ourselves. And God is telling us that it is not our duty to separate, but to stand apart. And in order to stand apart, there needs to be some growth. Because even tares grow. He's expecting to see the wheat grow as well so that the the difference can be connotated. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. So that was good, bad, indifferent, nice, mean. Which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but the bad cast away. And how often it is that we cast our net out in our lives and we gather it all, the good, the bad, the ugly and indifferent, but we don't allow God to separate it. We think that we can be the separators ourselves. We take on a lot of bad people, a lot of bad influences in our lives, and we feel like we can pick up and put it down whenever we're ready. Jesus is telling us that the net casts it all, it grabs it all, but there's a process of separation that needs and must and will happen. Process of separation. When it was full, they drew it to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into a vessel, but the bad cast away. So it shall be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. This takes us right back to where we were. It says, it says in, in chapter 41, I'm sorry, in chap, chapter 13, verse 41, the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. It is not our job to do the gathering or the casting away. (laughs) Because truth be told, if it was left up to us, even the righteous will be gathered and cast away. Because there are some folks, some things that we just don't like. Has nothing to do with Jesus telling us, has nothing to do with biblical input, but it has everything to do with our soul, which is our intellect, telling us that I don't like this. I don't like them. We come to church every week and we look at folk and just say, I don't like them. And God God forbid somebody say, well, why you don't like that person? You don't even have a reason. You can't even remember what it was or why it was that you don't like said person. You just know that you don't like said person. And Jesus is telling us that When the time comes, his angels will be the ones to do the separation. Don't come in here every morning looking to separate the good from the bad. Don't come in here and try to separate those who you feel like have a genuine love for God and try to put it up against your love for God and tell them where they stand. 
It's our job to come in this holy house and be gathered into that net and allow God to look at us as the weak that we should be, and he will separate the tares. We, we ought to be in here looking to be that weak so that not only we can identify ourselves to Jesus and the angels as that weak, but the longer that we make ourselves known as that we, a tear may just take notice of what is going on in our lives and be counted among the righteous. So don't look forward to doing the angel's job or Jesus' job. Just look forward to Jesus having his perfect work in you. Yes, Jesus is talking to you. He's talking to you. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That 50th verse is telling us that Although we have a lot of people who have indifferent attitudes to the word of God, who, who act like they aren't concerned with Jesus' direction for their life, that I live the way I live and I do what I want to do and I'll figure it out when I figure it out. The Bible is telling us that when it is too late and they are cast into the fire, they will be crying and sucking their teeth. There is never, never, never a better time than right now to get right with God. Because no man knows the day nor the hour when he shall come. So if you are not right with Jesus, chances are that you may be consumed in that fire. And what a time it'll be knowing that you knew what you had to do in order to enter the kingdom, but yet you were cast into the fire. It does not feel good knowing what needs to be done and turning a blind eye to it. Some things just get in, in you and, and, and it's hard to get it out of you and you, and you think, geez Louise, anybody else would have just left it alone. I have a, a real pet peeve with um, having, having a strong feeling about doing something or have, seeing someone else do something and not doing it myself. It could be something very small and minuscule. Um, you, you go into a building and, and you see a piece of trash on the floor and people will walk by it, walk by it, walk by it. And, and sometimes I get the spirit and I say, I'm going to walk by it like everybody else. But it just tugs at me and tugs at me until I got to go back and pick it up and throw it in the trash. And that's what happens to us when the spirit of God takes over our soulish wants. It tugs on us and tugs on us and tugs on us. And it says, there is a treasure that I have hidden inside of you that I want you to tap into. And we try to turn it away and we try to go into other things to block it out, but it tugs at you and tugs at you and tugs at you until you end up doing right anyway. And Jesus is telling you today, don't worry about those things that you feel like you need to do or you should do or you want to do that go against the things that I'm telling you that you ought to do. Because the treasure is in me, Jesus Christ. All the rest of these things might look and feel good, but if you give it to me, if you allow me to lead your journey, I promise you I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is talking to you. You don't want to be one of those crying, sucking your teeth at the last times because you knew what was right and you knew what Jesus was calling you into and to do and you turned a blind eye to it. 
Jesus says unto them, after giving almost an entire chapter of, of parables on the kingdom of God, and turning directly to them and saying a few more parables with the word again, again, and again. Jesus says, have you understood all these things? And they said unto him, yea, Lord. Then Jesus said unto them, therefore, every scribe was instructed unto the kingdom of heaven as like unto a man. A man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and things old. And on the one hand, he was talking to them about what had just transpired in chapter 12, saying that these scribes and these Pharisees, these men that are supposed to know the most about the scripture, the most about the word of God, have no understanding. And when you are truly in the word of God and understand the word of God, then what I'm telling you should be no mystery because I was prophesied way before my time. And it should have been an easy, easy yoke for you to bear, but unfortunately you've made it an unbearable yoke unto yourself. And Jesus is telling the Jews that yes, there will be some Jews that come into the sheepfold, but there will also be some new converts that are coming to the sheepfold. Because as he instructed his disciples, you will be my disciples and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. And this morning, as Jesus is talking to you, each one of you here listening to this lesson are seeking to instruct your lives more and more in Jesus' word. You are being instructed on the word of Christ. And yes, there will be some new conversion experiences because of your learning of the word of God. There will be some people who you'll be able to show your testimony to and talk to and lead them to Christ. But there ought to be some old people who you can give your testimony to. Some people who you have struggled with some people who have watched you go through the struggles and trials of life, some people who know whether you like your drink straight or on the rocks, some people who know when you used to like the leaf or the paper, some people who would know exactly what song would turn you out and get you on the dance floor to do those things to have a great night. And Jesus is telling you that not only will there be some new conversion experiences, but you need to be able to reach some of those who are in your household, some of those who are in your community, some of those who can say, I saw what she used to be. I saw what he used to be, but what I'm seeing now has a different feel. Who I'm seeing now must have been convicted by the word of Christ. As the blind man said in, in, in the parable of, of Jesus healing a blind man, some said he is him. Some said he is like him. Some thought he was another man. And the man spoke for himself and said, yea, I am he. And when we look in the mirror, when we look at those who know us most intimately, who have seen us struggle with Christ, who have seen us struggle before we knew Christ, and you can say, yes, it is me. And you can give them the living testimony of the word of God then Jesus' treasure is now shining in your life. It is not hidden under a barrel. It is not hidden in a field. But you have now found that one goodly pearl. You have given all that you have back over to Jesus with the solid and firm expectation that his word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you give it over to him, if he did it for Abraham in his late age and promised him an heir, if he did it for David when he was running for his life from Saul, if he rose Jesus from the dead, then by golly, there must be hope for me. And if you hang your hope in the treasure of Jesus Christ, 
if you open your ears and have them audible to Jesus' word in your life, then the treasure will be fulfilled in your life. You will have found that one great precious thing. There go those peas again. That one great precious thing that can give you fulfillment, that can give you peace, that passes all understanding. So the challenge this morning is to make sure that those ears that you have work. Have them audible to your to the word of Christ in your life and don't turn down the volume. For when the times get tougher, turn it up. When times get hard and the struggle gets real, turn it up. When you feel like you can't go on and the road is too long or too weary, turn it up. And allow Jesus to speak directly to you because there is a treasure on the other side of through. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you as we wait for our teenagers to come and give a report. And after our teenagers come and give a report, we will hear another song from our choir. And Second Mount Zion, after that song from the choir, we have one who we can call our own, who spent a lot of time with us in Second Mount Zion. One who, who can make God's word audible in your life this morning. And I'm, I'm thankful that I am here for the encore for I heard him preach the truth behind the treasure not too long ago, and it was a blessing. So I can confirm today that you will be blessed. For we have a preacher who can preach and will preach in the person and personality of Reverend Keith Pelzer. Amen? Amen. Do I start? Oh, I start? Uh, okay, uh, my brothers and sisters, my brother and my sister keepers, as Christians, we are set apart, living righteously set us apart from the wicked. To live righteously, we must have a heart of God living for his, living for his kingdom to bring others to his kingdom. To bring others to the kingdom, we must always share our stories of God. Of, we, must, we must always share our stories of God loves for us. Love. I say, if in your life, life 
And you don't know really what to do? Don't know really what to do. Just call on, just call on Jesus. He will see you through. For he knows, for he knows. Jesus, he knows. If in your life you are going through. Come on, and you don't know? And you don't know really what to do. Just call on Jesus. Just call on Jesus. Jesus, he knows. Jesus, he knows. Come on, let's go to verse two. If there's a trial that has come your way, if there's a trial that has come your way, and you're looking for a brighter day.
Let church say amen. amen. And amen again. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm excited. Y'all moving up in here. I like this, y'all. I said, you sure, Hagler? He said, no, you up. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> he knows how much we can bear. He'll never put more on you than, than you can bear. The only problem that I had with that statement was when we deal with absolutes, you'll learn that God is a God that you can never fully understand. But what you need to know, you end up knowing and finding out. So we qualify the statement, he'll never put more on you than you can bear. Right now, I'm sure that no matter how much weight you can lift when you go into the gym, you challenge yourself to put more weight on the barbells. Technically, I can lift 100 pounds on the barbell and pick it up and stand there and hold it. But the only way I'm going to get stronger is if there's more weight put on there than I'm used to handling. Am I helping somebody already? So what ends up happening is when you go to the gym or when you work out, you put more on than you believe you can bear. And somehow you tell yourself, I can at least try to lift it. You get one rep done and you realize, I might can make two. You try for three and when you tie it, you put it down. But then your mind says, I'm going to try it again. <laughs> and what it is, is it gives us the understanding that God's ways are above our ways, his thoughts are above our thoughts, and technically we couldn't bear that much weight. But the faith to try to lift it is what we kept at until we get to the point that we are now bench pressing 300 and more. And this is where my brother just said, when I look back over my life and think things over, the things that I couldn't handle in 2000, I'm able to handle it and more in 2023. If y'all shouted, I wouldn't even preach. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, I was bench pressing this amount when I was younger, but now, baby, I'm so much stronger. Woo! <laughs> All right, it's preaching time. I want to say, y'all already got your sermon. I mean, if you ain't get a sermon right there out of that Sunday school lesson, I don't know what's wrong with you. I was about to start crying. I was like, wow, he, he ain't lying. <laughs> when he said they should be able to see the you now, it should be people that know your business. They knew you when. But if all they got is, I remember when, and that's it, that's all they got, there's a problem. Because somewhere when they talk about what you used to be, they got to deal with people looking at you in the room now and seeing, are you sure that was them? Because the one I see now ain't the same person that you just described. Which means if the fact is they were that person, but I'm looking at who I'm looking at now, something happened. Okay, y'all just missed your shout. In other words, something happened, and I need to know what happened in her life to take her from the wretch that she was until the beautiful wonder work of God that she is now. What happened in his life? Because he should have been, I feel like preaching already, he should have been dead and gone. <laughs> But here's your conjunctions. I preached it on Monday. Watch the video. Here's your conjunctions. Somebody say, but God. That ought to be your shout right now. Can I get three seconds out of y'all to stand up and say, look at me, and I had some issues, but God. <laughs> Woo! I was going to throw in the towel, but God. Is anybody in here that got a but in their spirit to say, but God. Let's, let's, let's get to this sermon so I can let y'all get to y'all breakfast. I don't want y'all to miss the, the brunch specials. So, it's, Father, we thank you right now for this day.
that you have woke us up this morning, all that are able to say amen are saying amen because you woke us up this morning. God, even if our voice doesn't work, you bless somebody's hand and just wave it because they couldn't even say a word. God, if we can't run, we thank you that we're able to stand with a limp, God. God, we just thank you that if, if, if whatever it is that we lack, you have given us something to love you that much for. And so, God, we pray now that you hide Keith Pelzer behind the cross. Bless us now with ears to hear, as we have heard already. Bless our ears to hear. Bless these lips of clay. We thank you, God, for Pastor James Moore and all of the leadership and all of the input, the support from the pulpit to the pews, because it takes all of us, God, to do the kingdom work. We thank you for the appointed leaders, the appointed people in places to lead in God. But we thank you, God, for those who have been faithful enough to follow in the faith that you have given us, Father. So bless us now as we preach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God, we say amen, amen. and amen again. Amen. I'm going to cut cross Phil. Y'all already know me. Um, I'll save all the preliminaries to people who don't know me. Ask your neighbor uh, some of my business and they'll tell you. Amen. I sat over here for years and, and, and played. I'm here if you need me and I can come through. And thank you for being there with me um, through my years of pastoring and just growing up in church. All right. And so um, I, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate you. And let's give, let's give God a, pray, a hand clap praise for the, the young people singing on today. Amen. Amen. Great, great job. And, and I want to say this. I got to get this out and say this because it's necessary. What we heard just now and the testimony that we heard in the breakdown of that Sunday school lesson, I'm looking at a young man that reminds me of a lot of young men that I know that some of our issue is that we don't know how to articulate our faith. I think about the many funeral sermons and very various funerals I've been to and that need for people to talk. Y'all know, can I be real? We be on edge because it's like you got to keep saying two minutes. And the emotion of some people is they take the opportunity and they're trying to find from within a way to get into a faith that they don't even have. And God allows death to wake us up to reality that life is precious, that heaven is real. I feel for people where some people are like, I wish they sit down and shut up. I'm, I'm kind of hurting because I'm like, where are the people that know God that can be that one to talk to the uncle at the grill that don't want to talk to the preacher in the kitchen? Where are those people that, that, that they're going to be around the cousin that don't know the leaf from the paper? But without judging them, they're going to stand flat-footed and, and, and depart their faith to them so that it helps them so that when trouble comes, we're not weeping like those who have no hope. The challenge is for those of us who know. And the statement that we got earlier is, is, if you know, you know. And those who know are challenged to act out what you know and to live out what you know. So when I hear people other than the pastor, people other than the deacon, speaking boldly in faith, it, it, it does something and it pierces my soul in such a great way to say this is what's needed. So we take not for granted, oh, that was a good word. You have to now take that good word, and you got to be the preacher. I just said something right there. You, you, it's time out for, oh, you got to check out my pastor. No, no, they got to check out you. Shit. <laughs> In your sermon, uh, can, can, I, can I preach a quick, I'm going to sneak a quick preach, my sermon real quick, but I'm going to sneak a preach. The woman at the well, they eventually came to say, we got to hear Jesus, but what got them from where they were to Jesus was her mouth, not Jesus' mouth. In other words, it was her talk with Jesus. And her testimony about her talk with Jesus that got her to talk to them about Jesus and it had them to say, we got to see this man for ourselves. <laughs> That's how we're going to fill up the pews. Amen. Uh, listen, in the book of Psalms, chapter 27, 
familiar passage of scripture. I can't preach nothing that haven't been taught in the Sunday school, preached by the deacons, preached by the pastor, and that you done study. Psalms chapter 27. I'm going to read verse 3 and 4, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 13 and 14. The, 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 the first two verses, I am going to read it, and sorry to our tech, I'm going to read it out of the message translation, um, and, and just hear what it says. When besieged, I'm calm as a baby. When all hell breaks loose, I'm collected and I'm cool. I'm asking God for one thing, only one thing, to live with him in his house my whole life long. I'll contemplate his beauty. I'll study at his feet. Skip down to verse 13 in the King James Version. It says this, I had fainted, y'all remember this, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And verse 27, uh, chapter 27, verse 14 says, stay with God, take heart. Don't quit, and I'll say it again, stay with God. I just want to encourage you with these words, this, 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 this thought in mind is so right on point. The faith to follow through. The faith to follow through. Because it's my favorite time of the year coming up and we're almost on it, and when basketball has then gotten so bougie, it's gotten a little boring to me. <laughs> everybody crying about fouls and everybody just want money and stuff, cool back up and down the court. But um, football is one of my favorite sports. Uh, I, I just like football season. I even like arguing with my wife and, and Deacon Hagler on, on, on the commanders, uh, whatever their name is, them, that team. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and argue with my Eagles. I like, I, like, I like talking to some of the Dallas fans and going back and forth, but the thing that's interesting about football and even sports is the fact that even in a losing season, our Eagles got all the way to the Super Bowl and, and they, they did not win the Super Bowl. But unlike Christians, if Christians kind of had some eagle-like faith, they'll realize that even though you got this far and didn't win the ultimate prize, even in that loss, you still got work to do. They, they took a moment and said, we should have won that, we could have won that. Those who were emotional, they cried about not winning. They, they were angry about it. But you know what they did? They got back in the room and reviewed the tape to see what was it that we could have done better so that we could have won. Can I give y'all a losing team? Whatever team is at the bottom, nobody has any hopes that the Jets going to do anything. Nobody had hope that the Brown, Cleveland Browns going to do anything. Nobody got hope that certain teams going to do something. But that same team at the bottom of the barrel in their conference, they go on the practice field believing that they can win the Super Bowl because they're operating on a faith that most Christians don't even have. <laughs> Some of y'all looking at me funny like, well, they getting paid. Well, not everybody getting paid good dollar. There's some people doing a lot of work on the field, and their salary don't match the one that they blocking for. Ooh, I wish y'all hear what I'm saying. It, it, it's people working on the field taking the blunt of the hits for a quarterback that they ain't even getting a quarter of that man's money. But they still out there because they're focused on the goal of winning. And if believers understood about the focus on winning, we ain't worried about the big I's and little U's because in our faith and being on the team, I'm just happy to be on the bench. Yeah. When you're really about your team, I'm just happy to be on the bench. I'm, I'm glad I'm able to pour the Gatorade on the sidelines. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? Can I qualify this somewhere else in sauce? I I'd rather be a doorkeeper. Oh, I hope I I'm hitting somebody now. I just hit you close real quick. Y'all like, oh, I I'd rather be the quarterback. No, I'd rather just be a doorkeeper <laughs> rather, rather than to open my eyes in hell. And if, if you can appreciate just a doorkeeper mentality, God will do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask. Or even think, <laughs> faith to follow through. They, they, they review how the enemy won over me on this one here. You're not going to get me again on that. 
<laughs> I, I seen you coming. I thought I had to play right, but we didn't see that open side over there. They don't throw in the towel and say, I might as well give up. They keep going and find a way. Even when the season is over in a loss, they have hope and prepare for the next season to win. <laughs> so, so, so the thing is, even in this text, the, the, the tension that we have is the fact that in uh, uh, this text, we have light. And light in this chapter, uh, those of you who notice, is, is actually unique because it presents God and recognizes God as light. Now, the reason why I'm saying that, because in the Old Testament, it's common for light to function as a symbol of all that is positive and creative in the goodness of God, but yet here it's a title, not just a symbol. It's, it's, it's a digging of identity that, that he is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It's not just, oh, that's a sign. That's a sign. No, that, that sign is bigger than that's just a sign of who God is. God is my rock. <laughs> For many of us, rock was just a symbol. Oh, that he was up on a rock and died on Calvary. No, he is my rock. He's the solid rock, but he is my rock. He's the rock of my salvation. I have personalized light. It's not just a symbol, but he's ever, I feel like preaching, shining in my soul. That, that I have taken possession of that, that Jesus is mine, not just him who died, but he is mine. Help me, John P. Key. Jesus is mine. I have received him for myself. So now this ain't just a regular song that just feel good and sound good. It is great. So, so this psalmist understood how deep the darkness was. In other words, you've been through enough experience and been through enough darkness where it's like, I understand what darkness is because I've been through so much that I, I really understand. I'm not, I'm not wild when people talk about darkness. It's like, oh, I know what darkness is. Then he goes to understanding the danger that he's been in. He's recognized, I've been through danger seen and unseen, but I'm still talking about the danger seen and unseen, which means that the dangers didn't take me out because I'm able to talk about the dangers I've been through. The darkness didn't kill me. I'm able to talk about the darkness that I was in. I'm talking about darkness. I'm talking about danger, but he's also talking about the dominance of God. Can I help some of y'all singers out? Tragedies are commonplace. All kinds of diseases, people are slipping away. Economies down, they always seem to be saved as bad. But ask me, all I can say, thank you, Lord, for all you've done. <laughs> and, and watch this, Haskins, it get better because they say, it could have been me. Outdoors with no food and no clothes, or just alone, without a friend, or just another number with a tragic end. But, but there it is, there it is. But you didn't see fit to let it be and every day by your power, you can, every time I turn around, it seems like you just keep right on making a way. <laughs> the whole interest to this is my man's, my man, M-A-N-Z, my man seen the darkness, seen the dangers, but seen the dominance of God. Can I help y'all and get a little personal right here? I, every now and again, I have to pause. Don't, know, don't matter where I'm at. I have to pause and just look at and say, ain't God good? And you know what helps me, sis? You know what really helps me? It's Negro, I mean, folk that complain about everything that's wrong. And I say, when I look around and think things over, I gather all my good days and I gather all my bad days and I realize that my good days outweigh my bad days, so I might as well stop complaining and say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. 
See, some of us, you know what I thank you is? I thank you is our new car. I thank you is our new house. I thank you is money in our pocket. But how many people up in here, if I got 10 or more, that you're thankful is you didn't let none of these things be? <laughs> I, I'm thanking you for what I was trying to get into that you stopped me from going into. I thank you for that. I, I thank you for that. I was so booed up and booed in. I was all in. But you shifted something. I thank you for danger seen and unseen. <laughs> so, 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 so here's the thing about light. When he understands the light that God is, not just symbol, it helps us to understand. I'm going to give you all practicality. It helps you to understand at the doors you see red signs above the door. Those, 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 those are exit signs, and the exit signs are lit. Now, the deacons will understand this, the men will understand this, and, and ladies, I'm not excluding y'all, I'm just giving reference point of the job of the deacons and the men at the church. We understand that when the contractor come in, we have to, by code, have lights that work when all the power go out. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Watch this here. In other words, if it's night service and there's a blackout all over the city, there should be power reserved in those lights separate from the energy that's coming into the building. So that when we're at our darkest moment, people still have a way of escape. Because those lights are designed to hold power that's independent from the power that the world gives. But God is so good with technology that in your phone, you got a light in your phone. That if at least you charge the phone, the charge to keep our head, in somebody's darkest hour, you can shine the light on them. Y'all ain't feeling me on this? Oh, y'all don't go to clubs and stuff. I was late there. Shine a the light on them. Shine a the light on them. And I was like, oh, that'll preach because everybody's shining the light on it right now. I should tell y'all, take your phone out and shine the light on your neighbor and say, God is still shining on you right now. <laughs> Can I help anybody 55 and up? We used to sing a song, thanks for the lighthouse. Let me, let me move. Here's my, here's my little thing right here. The part that I skipped in here, <laughs> the part that I skipped in here, because I, I omitted the second and third and skipped to the last verse. <laughs> That's a hymn terminology for some of y'all. But, but in between this, betwixt between here, we look at the request. And his request just says, one thing I desire of the Lord that I may dwell in the house. And then he gives his reasons that I may behold the beauty. But then he goes to results. And the results is a follow through in his faith. How do you make a request and you give the reason why you request, but you're speaking the results? <laughs> okay, I ran by that too fast. It, it, around in verse 4 through 6, he's, he's throwing in there, right? He's throwing in there the request. One thing I've desired. But then he gives reasons, he says, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. But then in verse 5 and 6, he jumps straight to the results. And the results is, he shall, he shall hide me in the time of trouble. This is why some people, they always complain when trouble arise because they don't believe that even no matter what kind of trouble it is, the Lord has a way of hiding me. <laughs> That's faith to follow through. That even before I get to the valley, he's already waiting for me in the valley. That's a different kind of faith. And if he ain't there when I get there, I know he'll show up just when I need him most. Man, I feel like preaching. Watch this here. And, and the thing is, it's the results. And he said, he shall lift me above my enemies. People that complain about enemies all the time, they don't have faith that God will lift them above them. That's why they always complain about being beneath the enemy because they don't believe that God has the power to lift you above your enemy. This is why even at the table, in the presence of my enemy, God will do something better for me than what's going on across the table. And then he says, I'm going to rejoice. In other words, this is what I'm going to do regardless. I'm about to hit a nerve right now, especially for y'all singers. One thing I know I'm going to do 
is rejoice. <laughs> Daddy passed and gone, but I'm going to rejoice after, after we buried him six feet under. People talk bad about me, but I'm going to know I'm going to rejoice after I process what you said. I'm going through pain, but I know I'm going to rejoice that in all things, I'm just going to bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continuously be in my mouth. Do y'all see this follow through of faith? <laughs> so, so here's this, I learned a bougie word. I only knew it as M-O. And I looked it up as a uh, uh, modus operandi. <laughs> Never knew that for 30 years. <laughs> modus operandi. It's, it's when people say, check your M-O. And basically what that means in street terms is how you act and function as a person. <laughs> it's, it's, I see you, the, the MO, his MO is that, it, 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 he just violent. You, it's, it's understanding a person. So when we get to verse 13, I'm almost done. At verse 13, we get to the understanding that no matter what I operate and function, I function on faith. No, no matter what it is I got to do, I am persuaded. I am a Romans 38. I'm a Romans area person. I, that, that I'm, I'm persuaded that nothing's going to separate me from the love of God. So I move in faith. I breathe in faith. When I forget that I'm breathing God's air, I bless God to say this air that you give me for free, I'm only breathing it because you put it here. So I operate on faith. Y'all help me here. Paul said, in him we live, move, and have our being. In other words, I operate on faith. That's my MO. So remember, even Jesus grades faith. <laughs> Let me mess with your theological thinking. It's, it's kind of rough to say it, but I'm just going to say this and, 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 and try to build my case on it. Jesus grades faith. He said, oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> What we're not dealing with is fast forward in those in the faith. But, but oh ye of little faith is, is a part of the exercise of your belief system. And the thing I love about Pastor James Moore and everybody here that I learned in my time being here is the saying, my belief controls my behavior. So you have to look at when my behavior don't match what I say I believe, I got to go back by the grace of God and correct that thinking. I displayed to people that I lost hope in God, but I got to reassure them that he is my rock, that he is the strength of my life, that in him I live, move, and have my being. I got to remind myself that follow through is necessary. So here's my three things and I'm done. First thing is you got to believe in God's present goodness. It's right here in the text, you got to believe in his present goodness. And, 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 and the psalmist puts it like this, I would have lost heart unless I believed. A lot of people don't connect their would have to their actual belief. In other words, you got to remind yourself, I got it together because all I had was what I believe in my heart. And my survival has been on what I really believe deep down inside. My outward emotions had me crying and snotting and making everybody think I'm crazy and I gave up. But the reality is that my belief controlled my corrective behavior. So that the stuff that I shouldn't have done, the things that I shouldn't have said, the times when I cussed everybody out because I couldn't control my feelings, I know how to correct it and say, mama was acting a fool then, but the God that I believe, you know what? That's not going to happen again. The way that she got on my nerves and I outblasted, that's not really who I am. That's not going to happen again because I believe in God's present goodness. In other words, that it take me a little bit of time to see that God was with you the whole time in the valley. You can't keep walking through the valley like God ain't with you. You got to believe in the present goodness of God. Today is a another day and God can bless me today in spite of what happened on yesterday. It was rough these past two weeks, but God's present goodness is enough to get me started all over again. God's present goodness. That's why we sing the song, every day is a day of thanksgiving because he is a present help. <laughs> In times of trouble. So I'll skip this because y'all sound like y'all like something I'm saying. 
<laughs> the, the King James translation said, I, I would have, unless I believe, I would have. In, in other words, you, you have the right to exercise what you would have done. Some people have to look at what, what, I, what I would have done in that situation to smile and say, but the things I used to do, I don't do no more. And I promise you when you do that, you can't give nobody credit but God. <laughs> That's when you smile and say, Lord, you are good. Because <laughs> you're looking like I would have ripped her apart, but look at God. I mean, and your neighbors, here it is, brother, your neighbors are looking at you like, girl, I don't believe she ain't pop. He ain't do nothing. Because they've grown to say, if I hold my peace, <laughs> the peace I used to hold would have had somebody going to the hospital. But the peace I hold now saves somebody. Yes. The peace I used to have would have had broken bones and busted lips, but the peace I have now, it transcends understanding. Because I'm still confused why folk act the way they do, but I have peace that transcendeth all understanding, that keeps my heart, I'm trying to call what's this here, that keeps my heart and mind through Christ Jesus. That's the faith that I have to follow through. And so it's the first thing is, Remember God's present goodness, but the second thing is submit to God's calendar. Let me try this again. Submit to God's calendar. Stop trying to make up your own schedule. <laughs> I know that hurts somebody right there. Stop trying to do all the planning. You are already married to Christ. You're not planning a wedding right now. You're not planning a shindig, a baby shower, nothing like that. Sit yourself down, chill, and submit to God's calendar. <laughs> My wife probably watching online. I, I realize how jacked up I am with scheduling. So in the app, we got this thing. Brothers, y'all might know if you like this, maybe Green is, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but maybe Leroy is too. But, but my wife is better at scheduling than me. So, so in other words, I try to do it, but I jack it up, and I know, I'll, I'll be missing stuff, whatever. So my wife said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a family calendar. But here's the thing. She runs the family calendar. In other words, your pastor, Pastor Harry Moore, they don't call me when they want me to preach. They call my wife. Because they know that she handles the calendar, and I learned to submit to the calendar that she set because she knows the order better than me. I'm great at showing up and following what was given, and our problem is we don't know how to submit to God's calendar. <laughs> Y'all ready for this? Verse 14 says, wait on the Lord. Many of your problems that you're worried about is because you try to do it <laughs> without waiting on God. The problem is you trying to handle it and trying to fix it, but God says, wait on me. The psalmist said, I learned to wait on God. I still got to do something, but if I wait on God, wait on the Lord, he shall renew your strength. In other words, waiting got privileges. You weak because you ain't learned how to wait. Ooh, I, that just got somebody. You weak because you ain't learned how to wait. If you had waited, you'd have been stronger. <laughs> when, when you identify what you believe, there's a submission connected to that belief. If I believe that God is able to have his power engaged in everything I do, I understand that I have to prioritize what God's plan is. Present goodness reminds me of present help in times of trouble. Remember, this is where we find the space that says God is. So in spite of what happened in the past, God is. In spite of what's happening right now, God is. In spite of what's ahead of me, when I get there, God is already. 
And so if I submit to his calendar, God is the author and finisher of our faith. If he holds the time, he knows the time better than us. He's the one who made time, that stepped in the time, that did time in the time that he made. And he took the time out to save us on the cross. He took the time to die. He spent time three days in the grave. And then he got up on time to his calendar. And he's going to come back to save me and take me out of this mess on his own time. But my thing is, if I submit to his calendar... I will operate better. So my third point, I'm done. You got to stand boldly against fear. You got to believe, submit, but you got to stand boldly against fear. And that's where you stand in strength. You stand in your struggle. You find a way to get up. You see an old mother that can't really walk like she used to, but if the child gets smart with her, <laughs> you see some kind of strength you ain't never seen before. It don't matter if it took grandma 18 minutes to get up. She believed I'm going to stand up and knock you out for being smart with me. So, so if, 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 if grandma or grandpa can find a way to get up with all your struggles, you got you to gotta find a way to stand up even in your struggle and understand that God has the ability to, to put my bones in place to stand Stand up. It may not be physical. I'm trying to get your spiritual because you've been down for a long time. But God has a way of allowing that if you just at least take and say, if I can just put my arm on the side of the table and engage my arm over here, God has a way of making my legs move like never before. And before I know it, I realized that I once was down, but God lifted me up in some kind of way. I can't explain how it happened. Y'all heard it in the Sunday school lesson. No, that's the guy right there. That's the one that was in the tombs. That's the one that was outside of the gate. But he's shouting and praising God in the temple. Who did that? And what did they say? John and, 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 and Saul, they said, look, that ain't us. That's Jesus who did that. It's by the grace of God that this was put together, that it happened. And that is your testimony that gets people thinking, I got to try Jesus because I'm not getting a full explanation from you or how this work, but what I have is the evidence that God saves. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. I, I don't know exactly, and I don't know why he sacrificed his life, but looking at you, I realize that he's able. I, I, I feel like preaching that right there. I, 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 you, can't, you can't even explain why God took you and saved you. You can't explain all of it, but what I see is the evidence of what God is able to do. Why? Because you got follow through in what you should Fear and fantasy, they got a likeness. Fantasy Island dealt with living out the livable in a space authorized to allow that to happen. Fear is an island that bans faith to function. When you live in the island of fear, you don't allow for faith to function. So you got to get out of Fantasy Island and face the reality that yes, we do deal with trouble on every side. But if I can repeat myself from Monday, it's the fact that the conjunctions are my follow through. In other words, whatever's on this side of the conjunction is a big problem. But with my conjunction, I'm following through to say, but God is able. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I, I, I follow through on understanding, but, but God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all I could even ask or think. I, I function on the conjunction of knowing that God can still handle it. Because when I look back over my life and think things over, God took care of of the situation then and he's the same God that can take care of my situation now and the thing that I understand about standing in fear is that God understands when I stand against fear I'm reminded of 2nd Timothy verse 1 in chapter 1 and verse 7 it says God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power don't miss that here power love and a sound mind in other words if God didn't give us the spirit of fear you cannot operate in something that God has not given you if God has changed your nature you got to dig within yourself and say the fear that I've shown is not my spirit that's my feelings but when I operate off of feelings I'm going to continue to fail but when I operate on faith 
there's a follow through that's going to build my family up when I operate on faith. When I operate on faith, I don't get stuck on what I don't understand, but I trust God to make a way out of nowhere. I don't sit on my do nothing, but I rise up against the fear and say, God is bigger than my fear. Because whatever my purpose is, my purpose is going to suffocate my problems. Because God has given me the power to get through my problems because he has purpose intended for me. And so if God got purpose intended for me, he didn't say that I'm not going to have any problems, but he said I'm bigger than all of your problems. Do you understand that even Jesus, I know y'all ready to go, when he had to go to a hill called Calvary, you like Calvary and Calvary is intriguing because Calvary was actually a problem. The problem that Jesus had in going to the cross was the fact that he had to die. We're talking about God who made life, who gave us life, who was life before we knew life. God could have did it another way if he desired to do. But because he said what he was going to do and he couldn't go back on his word, he had to follow through on what he said he was going to do. Do you understand that even the disciples tried to stop Jesus from following through? Don't miss that here. They said, they said, Jesus, do you really have to go this route? But he said, I must be about my father's business. And even to the point that Jesus shows us in kenosis, his human struggle, being 100% God, 100% man, he had to show us his human struggle. In his human struggle, he's up there on top of a mountain, and Jesus Jesus himself is starting to sweat like drops of blood coming down and he said out of his own mouth father if thou wilt move this problem out of the way and allow me with power to go into my purpose but God said I can't take out the problem because if I took out the problem, there would be no glory in the purpose and the power. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying right there? Does that make sense? If I took out the problem, it wouldn't give no kind of glory to the purpose and the power that I've given you to handle and overcome your problems. That's why I said we are troubled on every side, but and however, but notwithstanding, nevertheless, and Jesus said a conjunction, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Huh? Is there anybody up in here who can say huh, my problems, I got many of them, but praising God ain't one of them. I got 99 problems, but trusting God ain't one of my problems because I trust in the Lord with all my heart. Lean not to my own understanding. If I'm a lean baby, guess where I'm a lean at? I'm a lean on Jesus. Y'all just y'all lean with me. If I'm going to lean, I'm not leaning on none of the problems. I'm leaning on Jesus. Jesus, uh, because I have lost my strength. Uh, I have lost the ability, but there's something on the inside uh, that says I'm not operating off of me, uh, but I'm operating on the power that's in me. Uh, can I help y'all with a follow through? Uh, those of you who do like basketball, uh, you understand that follow through uh, is the key to doing everything, uh, but there's many people on the court right now, uh, and the problem is. Huh? You've been in church for a long time. Huh? And every time the devil get in your face, huh? you keep trying to make threes. Huh? And you're hitting the rim, huh? but it ain't going in. Huh? And after a while, the coach named Jesus huh? is telling you on the sideline, huh? yes, you've been going to church. Huh? Yes, you've been reading your Bible. Huh? Yes, you've been singing in the choir. Huh? But when problems come through, huh? you don't know how to follow through and your reason why you keep missing and the reason why you keep losing the game is because next time when you get into practice of bowing down on your knees you got to say Lord I trust you and I know I'm up against a big enemy but there's something in me where you put the ball in my hand I'm at the 
three-point line, huh? but I'm not just going to throw it up this time, huh? but I'm going to follow through. Huh? Do y'all understand huh? that the best basketball players huh? that know what they're doing, huh? you always see a picture huh? of their hand huh? like this huh? because they realize huh? that's good huh? because I follow through. Huh? The basket done made, huh? the ball done dropped, huh? but they still standing there huh? doing the lean and the walk away, huh? saying, I thank God huh? that this win huh? is because I learned huh? how to follow through. Huh? But can I tell you huh? that Jesus huh? was sticked up by a hill called Calvary, huh? and somewhere huh? they spit on him. Huh? They pierced him in his side. Huh? They whipped him all night long, huh? put a crown of thorn on his head. Huh? But there's something huh? about the follow through. Huh? And God said, huh? if you don't know huh? how to follow through, huh? I'll dispatch some angels huh? to pray for you. Huh? And the angels prayed huh? and strengthened Jesus. Huh? And when the disciples thought huh? he was going to throw in the towel, huh? Jesus said, huh? let's get ready. To rumble. Y'all ain't feeling me. Jesus said, let's get ready to rumble. And when those Negro folks showed up and they said, we came, Jesus said, what y'all here to do? Y'all dismiss that. He said, what y'all here to do? They said, we seek Jesus, the man of Nazareth. He said, I am he. Let's get this party started. And he allowed them to take him captive, huh? march him up on top of the hill. Huh? But Jesus, huh? in the follow through, huh? this is about the kingdom. Huh? So even while he was dying, huh? don't miss this here. Huh? Even while he was dying, huh? Jesus had a conversation huh? talking to two thieves on the cross. Huh? One just didn't get it, huh? but the other one said, huh? we should be here. Huh? And they said, Father, huh? just remember me. Huh? And sometimes your follow through huh, is saying, Lord, huh, remember me. Huh. Your follow through huh, is trusting God. Huh. But back to Jesus. Huh. Give me 30 more seconds. Huh. Jesus, huh, he said, Father, huh, into thine hands huh, I commit my spirit. Huh. And he followed through huh, because he said, I must die. Huh. And he followed through. Huh. He hung his head huh, in the locks of his shoulders. And the Bible says, your pastor says, he died, he died, he put his head there, he gave up the ghost. But somebody, they said, surely this is the Son of God. And then the follow through. I need four women to say, I know how to follow through. They showed up even to a dead Jesus. They made sure. Huh, to get them pretty huh, and they put them in a borrowed tomb huh, and then the follow through huh, was that he had to be in darkness huh, but somehow huh, after the stone was rolled there huh, they had to come through huh, and still see Jesus huh, and they followed through huh, because one disciple huh, he looked in the tomb huh, but the other one said huh, I gotta see huh, the place where the body was huh, his follow through through huh, increased his faith huh, because he said he's not here huh, but where is he huh? so they followed through huh, looking for Jesus huh, in all the wrong places huh, but Jesus huh, showed up huh, and the Bible says huh, that early huh, on Sunday morning huh, he followed through huh, but he kept following through huh. he said I will never leave you huh, nor forsake I'm sorry, Second Mount Zion. I'm just too happy right now that Jesus, when he went back up, at the same time, the Holy Ghost was coming down. And he said, I'll never leave. 
believe you, but there's a follow through that I believe that he's coming back one day. So no matter what I'm going through, if I die tomorrow, the dead in Christ shall rise and those who remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Tell your neighbor, I'm following through. I'm following through. I believe God. I would have fainted, but I follow through. The, the, the thing that kills me is, wait on the Lord. <laughs> Be still and know. Knowing is the follow through. And the know, we don't have to explain what we know. But all we got to know is that we know that we know. <laughs> that, that God is still able. That's why I love that part. Now unto him who is able. And, and, and then the breakdown of that in the Greek is it leads all the way down to him able. <laughs> and when I get down to him able, I just, I just know that everything I'm looking at, that God is able. And this is my follow through. The faith to follow through. God bless you. You may be here on today. And, and, and you have not been operating in faith to follow through. Understand this. Many, many, many times we grow up in church and think we have it because we sang in the choir, because we shouted in church. But then reality really strikes us. And we realize that, that we, we operate in a way that's not matching up to what we've been doing. Because it's when trouble come that that faith is going to be tested. And me being here through so many going home services and working with funeral homes and all, I, I really have a heart and a passion for that the Bible lets us know, and, and we used to sing a song, the day is passing gone, the evening shade appear. Oh, may we all remember well the night of death draws near. We lay our garments by upon our beds to rest. Death may soon disrobe us all of everything we possess. People are still trying to accumulate things getting stuff. And God doesn't say we're not going to have a great life and great stuff, whatever, but that cannot be our priority. The priority to best life is accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's at that point that you understand life on the other side of what the world would understand, like the matrix. If anybody remember the matrix, the, the, the biggest part is the red pill and the blue pill, and saying, do you want to stay stuck in this or do you want to be open to the real reality of what's going on? And it's that, that old saying, I've decided to make Jesus my choice. I, I choose to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. It doesn't make you uncool. It doesn't make you corny. That's a myth that we used to present to ourselves because I've grown to be around some cool people. There's a saying on the internet that I don't really agree with, but they say every good preacher should have somebody around them that ain't scared to cuss. What they mean by that is they kind of saying you need like a Peter around you, but I've never heard a, a good pastor overemphasize that Peter cut somebody's ear off. And even in the text, the Bible is the only book that interprets itself. Even in the text, Jesus shows us correction and basically said, that's not how I operate. So what we get from that is Peter wasn't scared, but we also seen Peter was a punk too. Because when it came time that he could have stood up for Jesus, he, he was running somewhere, hiding in the cut. But then we also see, I'm opening the doors right here. We also see that out of all his little gangsterism and then his mistakes and his punkism, Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And he said, Peter, I have prayed for thee that your faith fail if not. And even when he did not follow through, your pastor preached this, I remember, after Easter, a lot of pastors will preach about Peter. All of a sudden, he, where you going? I'm going to fishing. That's not the follow through, bro. The follow through is you have an assignment for kingdom growth. 
And so Jesus already took care of the problem because he said, I have prayed for thee that your faith fail if not. And he says, when you have come through this, strengthen your brethren. God has called you to be a strength to your family, your friends, your neighbors, but you can't do it without his power. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're trying to do it on your own, and it's not going to work. You can keep shooting all you want, but you have not understood, and you don't have the, the, the lesson learning of follow through. Follow through gets you through things that you never would get through before. I cannot do it on my own. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need it. Bless me now. And God is going to bless his children. So if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not his child. You're a person in the world that God loves the world that he gave. The consequence is, whosoever believeth shall have everlasting life. And the benefits, somebody say benefits. The benefits comes in your belief. If you have not believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, you are missing all the benefits of peace that transcends the fall understanding. If you are here today, you have not accepted the Lord as your Lord and Savior, you can come now. You can come now, Lord, I give my life to you. Lord, save me. You don't have to understand it all now. It's great teaching, preaching, and learning here to get you to understand clarity. What have I walked into? What has happened? What's the wonderful change? I'm a witness to it. You're in good hands here. So if you have not decided, and today you want to make Jesus your choice, trust me, it's, it's all good. Amen. If you're here and you have already accepted the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but you're searching for a church home, you can make Second Mount Zion your choice, church home. If you're here today, you've experienced this worship service. It's great preaching and teaching here. You can come under Christian experience. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Right. Amen. Can we thank Pastor Pelzer for a mighty, powerful word? For God does not disappoint when his word goes forth. It's tithing and giving time. What kind of giver does God love? Amen. As we prepare to give, our trustees are now coming. If you would like to give virtually, you can scan the QR code. Those in the balcony, if you can come now.
things come from thee. And of thine own have we given. Right before Pastor Pelzer comes to give us the benediction and send us away, we ask that whoever has a t-shirt to claim, please do not forget to stop at the back of the church and see Deacon and Deaconess Green to retrieve your t-shirt. Once again, we want to thank Pastor Pelzer, and it's in his hands to give us the benediction. Let us all stand and be dismissed. I thank you for your tolerance of me and also just... Um, your attention to God's word. And so I'm personal. I love you all. I appreciate you. Um, and don't take preaching lightly. Hear the words. Sometimes you got chew the meat, spit out the bones. Um, you know, y'all get what I'm saying? Because we need the word of God. It all stems from there. And then let's give God a hand clap of praise once again for our ministers and everybody up front. We thank God for you. Father, we thank you for this day and we bless your name for being who you are. God, a lot has shifted in our time of serving and our different various generations, but God, you are a blesser and a keeper. And so God, through um, uh, life and growing, we've seen that you have been God through all of it. You have never left us nor forsaken us. Even at times when we felt alone, we knew that you still had your hand on us. So we thank you, God. We thank you for controlling our environment, even if you weren't in the same room and we felt empty, God. We thank you that you were controlling the atmosphere. And so, God, help the generations even after the prominent generation to understand that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the God that you have been through all the ages is good enough to save me, to heal me, to deliver me, to bring me through, and my faith to follow through. Now unto you who is able to keep us from falling, present us faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy. All wise Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. People of God say amen, amen. and amen.